Um, we live in uh, the Charlotte, North Carolina uh, area, and uh, a little bit on the east side, Indian Trail, if you're familiar with that, so not, not too far from here, about two and a half hours, but, uh, but uh, we're helping actually in a church plant uh, up in Huntersville, and so folks, yeah, actually the Jordans used to be at that church, and they kind of come to visit, they've recently moved to Raleigh, so good to have them here, good to see David and Kathy as well, uh, they used to be at Bible Baptist, where I was on staff for a number of years. And uh, so we were kind of surprised this morning. I looked, I saw, I think I recognize them. And, and so uh, it was good to kind of become reacquainted with them as well. As I preach tonight, I, I find myself a burden about an area that I think most of our churches struggle a little bit with. And what I mean by that is I think in a lot of our churches, if we're not careful, we become very, very comfortable. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is this, we're, we, we have a fellowship, we know each other, we're, we're comfortable with each other, and quite often we have our own little world, our own four walls, and if we're not careful, we will find ourselves kind of hiding behind those four walls. And yet, as I'm sure you will know, just within hundreds of yards of here, there are hundreds of people who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I fear today that the, the, this is a day of what I would call spiritual lethargy. As a whole, the church has become very comfortable. In fact, we've forgotten the verse in 1 Corinthians that says this, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So tonight, I believe the Lord has directed me to speak on the subject of evangelistic fervor evangelistic fervor. I'm turning to a passage of the book in the book of Acts, if you'd like to turn there, Acts chapter 17. A well-known to me as I've talked with your pastor in the last day or so, he's brought this passage up several times, and he had no idea that I was going to speak on it tonight. So it was sort of a confirmation to me that the Lord had directed me in this way. And I want to read the passage, Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16 until the end of the chapter. And then we'll look at this passage, trying to understand its context, a little bit about what the Lord would have for us from the passage. Acts chapter 17 and verse 16 and following, and it reads as follows. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him into the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. And we would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar into this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the things before appointed him, appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though they be not far from every one of us, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are of the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the, thing, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed 
which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance of all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when, and when they heard the, re, heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Shall we pray? Father, we ask that you might allow this something that would touch our hearts tonight. Stir us, O oh God. I pray that you would raise up in the midst of this congregation numerous people that you would stir them about the matter of evangelism. Lord, I pray that we comfortable, that we would not hide behind our four walls, but that we would have a passion and a burden to see others come to know Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon this time together. We pray that you would, would, the Spirit of God would work mightily in our hearts this evening. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be glorified through what is accomplished. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage is an interesting passage. If you go back, and we won't take the time to read it, but you go back earlier in the chapter, Paul has been preaching the gospel, first of all, in Thessalonica. He had some success there. There were people that came to Christ, and as a result of that, there was opposition that was stirred up among the Jewish leaders, and they kind of chased Paul out of town. He went from there to Berea. Uh, he found even greater reception there. They were more noble in the sense that they were searching the scriptures and, and seeking to understand what Paul was saying, and as a result of that, they began to, many began to trust the Lord, and the same people that had stirred up the opposition in Thessalonica now had come to Berea, and literally Paul has to flee once again. And he's traveled some 200 miles or so into the city of Athens. At this point, he's by himself, probably a little weary, maybe just kind of worn out, as we would say. It seems as if he comes here not so much with the intention to start a church or begin a work as it is just sort of get a, to get a little respite where he can just sort of get away and kind of catch his breath a little bit. But as he's there in this city of Athens, he finds himself being unusually stirred by the Lord with regards to the needs that are there in Athens. In spite of his weariness, there was an evangelistic fervor that Paul had, that God stirred in his heart, that I'm praying tonight that God would stir in all of our hearts. The very fervor that Paul had for those in Athens is, I believe, the evangelistic fervor that he wants us to have right here, you to have, particularly right here in this area of Raleigh. And so I, I want you to give some thought to this tonight. This perhaps is one of the greatest needs in most of our churches today because if we're not careful, we will become extremely what we would call evangelistically flat. Just kind of comfortable. Just where everything's convenient. Everything's kind of easy. And we can so easily forget that there are people all around us that need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now, in this passage, I want to share with you three thoughts tonight. The very work that God did in the heart of the Apostle Paul is the work that I believe he wants to do in our hearts tonight. The very pathway that he took Paul down that, that stirred him into action is the same pathway that I believe God wants to work in our hearts tonight. If we're going to be evangelistically stirred tonight and have a burden for others that need to know Jesus Christ, the first thing that needs to happen in his life, in your life, is this: that is that God wants you to be sensitive to the needs of those that are around you. Look again at verse sixteen. It says, "Now while Paul waited for them, he was waiting for his companions to come from Berea to join him. He was waiting there. He was alone. Notice his spirit was stirred in him. Notice why, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry." If you're going to become sensitive to the needs of those around you, you need to take time to observe the spiritual condition of those that are around you. This word saw is an interesting word. It's, it's the word, a Greek word that we get our English word theater from. The idea is you're looking on. Uh, it means to look at, to observe, to perceive. 
And, and what was happening is, is Paul was there, and this wasn't his initial intention, I don't believe. He just couldn't help but begin to look around him and observe the needs of the people that were around him. It was a city that was wholly given to idolatry. Can I ask you this evening, when was the last time you just saw yourself kind of looking around, looking around your neighborhood perhaps, looking around the, the folks with whom you work on a regular basis? looking at those maybe with whom you shop and just sort of observing and kind of taking in the needs of the people that are around you, recognizing that most of the people you contact on a regular basis, they're lost. They know nothing of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They know nothing of the forgiveness that, that most of us tonight, hopefully all of us tonight, regularly delight in and take, take joy in because we know that our sin has been forgiven and that we're heaven bound. But that's not so with the most, most of the people around us. And if we're not careful, we can live in a world and, and rub shoulders with people on a regular basis and not even notice what is going on in their lives. Athens was an interesting city. It, it had well gone past its heyday, but, but it, it really still was a prominent city in this day. Probably about 10,000 people would um, it was a city that was considered a university city. Certainly you can connect with that in this area. Uh, it had a well-known library, a well-established library in that, in that part of the world. It was a city of architecture. Uh, the Parthenon was there. It was a philosophical city. Uh, it was the native city of Socrates and Plato. And it had been adopted by Aristotle and Epicurus and Zeno. This was a city that was culturally sort of elite, it was philosophically just sort of engulfed with all of the philosophies of that day and all of the, just the, the sort of the height, if you would, uh, of that culture. That was the kind of city that it was. One writer by the name of Petronius had said this, it was easier to find a god in Athens than a man. And you'll see that in a minute in the passage. Pliny ex actually extra, uh, estimated that there, although there were only some 10,000 people at this time, that there were about 30,000 public gods. So you can imagine anywhere you would look, there would be idols. There would be gods to whom people were bowing down and worshiping. And as Paul is taking all of this in, and it's beginning to sort of dawn upon him and sink in into his mind and his heart, he found himself, he couldn't help but notice what was going on around him. When's the last time you took a good look? A good look at your neighbors, a good look at your coworkers, a good look, a look at the, this area and just allowed it to sort of sink into your heart and sink into your mind and the reality of people with whom you, you, you bump into or rub shoulders with almost every day that most of them are lost. Most of them need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. If you're going to develop a sensitivity toward their needs, you have to open your eyes. You have to observe. You have to take in what's happening around you and allow it to sink into your, to your heart. And not only that, but you also, if you're going to become sensitive, you've got to allow their spiritual condition to be, begin to impact your heart. I fear sometimes we become a little insulated. It's not that we don't know. It's not even maybe that we haven't even observed. It's that we hold everything a little bit abey, a little bit distance. It's sort of like you're driving to the road, uh, down the road and you come to this uh, stop sign or maybe a red light and there's someone out there with a sign that, that you know, kind of scraggly looking and, and they're holding up a sign because they're saying they need food or whatever. It, you Probably all we've done this is you're driving there and you're kind of, you're not sure whether you should help or not help and, and you find yourself struggling in your heart to, you know, do I close my heart down or do I open my heart up? That can happen to us almost every day of our lives. Not so much with the guy that's at the corner as it is to the needs of the people that are around us. Because when we begin to really become sensitive and we open our eyes to their needs, we've got to decide whether we're going to open our hearts also to their needs. Notice verse 16 again. It says, 
Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. This idea of being stirred means to be literally provoked, to be angry, to be incensed. Now, maybe part of that was because of all the idolatry was an offense to God and, and, and that that alone was something that stirred the heart of Paul. But no, no doubt some of it was the fact that as he saw the people that he observed, he also saw what Pastor talked about this morning, the spiritual blindness that was there. They're lost. They, they, they have no help. They're searching in many cases. That's why they were involved in idolatrous practices. That's why they were searching to find some way in life. And yet what they were searching for, they did not really know. They did not really understand. And as Paul saw all of this, what happened is God began to touch his heart. Now tonight, dear friend, will you allow God to touch your heart? Will you not simply observe, but will you open your heart to what God may want to do through you? Like you may say, hey, look, I'm not a preacher. Uh, I'm not comfortable. You don't have to be a preacher. All you got to do is be willing to tell your story. Tell your story. Open your heart to people that have a need. And what was happening is instead of distancing himself from them, he was moving toward them. There was an openness there was, a, there was a sensitivity. There was a willingness to open his life and to, to minister to them and to help him. I fear sometimes that we have become kind of Teflon in our spirits, our heart. Nothing, nothing moves us. Nothing stirs us. We're comfortable in our Christianity. We're comfortable in our subculture. We have our church and our school and our friends and our world, and we have all everything around us that we could ever want and ever need. And if we're not comfortable, we will find ourselves staying within those four walls to the point where we just don't reach out. Now, I believe tonight God's wanting you to open your heart, to become sensitive to the needs of the people around you, and not just observe, but really to, to open your heart to embrace their needs, which as you become sensitive, the second thing that Paul did and that God, I believe, wants to do in our lives tonight is not only a sensitivity, but he wants you to reach out to meet those needs. Now, if you become aware of some, a need, you've got a choice. You can step back and say, I'm not getting involved. You know, not, not comfortable, not going to step out, too risky. You know, I, I'm busy. I've got a lot of things going on in my life. I just don't have time for this right now. Or you can step up. And in Paul's case, you get the impression very much so that even though he had been chased out of Thessalonica, and even though he had been chased out of Berea, and even though he was weary and probably needed a little rest, he couldn't. Sit back. He couldn't hold back. He had to step up. Notice verse 17. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and the market daily with them that met with him, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans. There are three different groups here that I want you to see that, that what he does. First of all, he steps up to reach out for those that are closest to him. Those were the ones that were in the synagogue. If you follow Paul's ministry, inevitably what he would do is go into an area, if there was a synagogue there, that's where he would start. Now, I think there were a number of reasons he did it. Probably one of the reasons was if he didn't try to reach the Jewish people first and he went to the Gentiles first, the Jewish people would have nothing to do with him at all. But he, and another reason, certainly if you read Romans and other passages, he had such a burden for his own people. I'm speaking to some folks tonight. It's an interesting area, a lot of cultures in this area. And may I simply say that if you come from a, a particular culture, no one will have a burden for your people like you will have because they're your people. No one will have the ability to reach them like you can because they're your people. You speak their language. You know their culture. You, you understand them in a way that, that maybe those of us that are from a different part of the world do not understand them. 
But he started with people that were close to him first, and he began to reach out to them and to share with them the gospel. It, it says, therefore, dispute of the idea. He's sort of reasoning or arguing with them, if you will. Um, and notice it says, uh, in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. The, re- the devout persons were Gentiles that were worshiping in the Jewish synagogue. And he was reaching out to them because those were people that he could connect with easiest. Those, that was the easiest crowd that Paul was going to minister to. And may I say to you that the people around with whom you live and with whom you work and you have some contact with and at least you know their name and, and, you, and you, know, you converse with them even though you may not know them well, that's the, that, those are the ones that you have the most opportunity to impact, to have some influence with. You know, it may be slow, but Little by little by little, God will begin to work in their hearts. If you begin to get a burden for them and you begin to reach out to them and you begin to embrace them and you begin to connect with them, you will find yourself before long having an opportunity to give a gospel witness to them. But notice, secondly, he didn't stop there. It wasn't just those that were in the synagogue, but it says also in the market or in the marketplace, the agora daily with them that met would meet with him. So he branched out, started with those closest, then he went out into the public sphere, if you would. Uh, This was really the hub of the Athenian society. It was where they did all the business. It was where everybody met. It was the plaza, if you would, where they would meet together and they would sort of group together. And here is Paul probably exhausted from what he just experienced, but he just couldn't hold back. He had to give them the gospel message. I feel what's happening in our churches is we've kind of pulled out of our society. And what we need to be doing is going out into our society. You know, you know, there was a day, and as a kid when I was growing up, we would have different act- events and things at church, and you could invite people to church, and really all you had to do was kind of hang a shingle out, and people would come. They'd come to church very readily. It was sort of the culture to come to church. May I say, folks, that day is probably gone. And while we certainly want to invite people to church when you have events and things like that, for the most part, it's a whole lot harder to get someone from out there to come in here than what it is to get someone in here to go out there. I think this is what this passage is referring to. We need to have a burden for our culture where we're willing to come out of our cocoon, out of our comfort zone, and find ways to reach out into the community where we can actually begin to form relationships that will lead to redemptive opportunities of being able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. A number of years ago when I was pastoring in Indianapolis, I got burdened about this as a pastor because I was behind my four walls all the time. You know, I ministered to the same people, same church, and it was a good, good church, good-sized church. We were 500, 600, somewhere around there. And uh, we, it was a, we, we had a lot of people, a lot of history, nice facilities, and all the kind of things that you would typically think would be. But I just found myself feeling like, you know, other than the people that visited our church, and we had some visitors, a pretty rarely stream of visitors, I, didn't, I wasn't connecting with our community. Interesting enough, my wife's hairdresser uh, was a believer, and uh, he had a real burden. He wanted to start a business community on the east side of Indianapolis where we lived. And I was, I, he had cut my hair as well, and I was there one day, and he was telling me about all this, and he says, you know, I want to do this. He says, but I'm a real good kind of starter, and, and you know, I'm the idea guy, but I really need some help to kind of make it work. Would you be willing to help me? And I said, sure. And it wasn't long where he was the president, and I was the vice president of the east side business community in, in Indianapolis, and we had a school that we had started, and that became, that was my business. And so I I became part of that and became very active in that. Now, folks, what that did for me was it it, it connected me to all kinds of people that I would have never had any connection with whatsoever. I mean, they knew I was a pastor. I didn't hide anything. I wasn't trying to sneak in or anything like that. I was very open, but I began to connect with some of those people. I remember one lady. I was telling the pastor at lunchtime. She was kind of a 
kind of a, she'd come out of a military background. She was a gruff sort of gal and kind of a take charge sort of gal. And I don't even know what her business was, but it was more industrial. And, and uh, she was just a kind of a hard driving person. And, you know, in those meetings, sometimes she was a little, you know, a little difficult to handle. She had ideas and whatever. But I remember when, when and I don't remember if it was a mother or a father, but one, one of her parents died and I attended the funeral of her parents. I still remember I, she, was, she was physically and emotionally moved that I would come and attend her parents' funeral. Because, you see, she didn't even really know any pastors. And the fact that I wasn't directly connected and I had not, no real reason to be there other than I cared about her and was interested in her and wanted to bring some sort of comfort to her, that was moving to her. And it opened our relationship. And it gave me opportunities to, to have further ministry or additional ministry with her. Folks, I'm not the only person. Let me ask you this. How are you involved in your community in ways where you can build friendships, where you can make connections that will lead to redemptive opportunities of being able to share the gospel? It can be all kinds of things. It can be some sort of club, some sort of interest. You might, maybe you like to sew, or you like to draw, or maybe you're athletic and you like to be involved in sports in some way, or something that you're, you can do, that you can connect with. But when you go out into the community, you're not just going to go, you actually have a purpose in mind. You're wanting to reach to people, reach out to people, connect with people, with the idea of ultimately praying that God would open an opportunity to give the gospel. Paul went out in the community. The third area that Paul dealt with was those that were least likely to listen. Notice in verse 18, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. Now I want to develop the passage extensively, but the Epicureans were people that believed that pleasure and avoidance of pain are the chief end of man. That was what they sought. The Stoics saw themselves the self-mastery was their idea. Uh, they believe that, that self-mastery comes from being um, indifferent to pleasure and pain, hence reaching the place where one feels nothing. These were philosophers of that day. They were prominent teachers of that day. They were leaders within that culture of that day. And frankly, if you were to look and observe and think about all the people that Paul would have sought to witness to or to give the gospel to, the very least likely to actually accept it would have been these. Now, how do I know that? Well, notice how they respond here. Uh, verse 18 says, and some said, what will this babbler say? The word babbler means seed picker. It's a derogatory term. Well, what they're doing is they're saying, you're like a little bird that just kind of goes from bush to bush, and you pick up seed here, and you drop it over here. And what, what can you tell us? What do you know? And, and then it goes on, and it says he seems to be for a set or forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. In this passage, he is facing a very hostile, if you would, a very hostile environment. And of all the folks that would have been least likely to ever embrace the message that Paul was sharing, it would have been the philosophers of that day. And yet, folks, you know what? We never know. We never know what God may be doing. We never know what people may be struggling with. We never know what may be going on in their lives. And sometimes, if we're honest, we kind of shrink back and say, oh, I don't know if I really want to go there because this person is not likely going to be real open to what I want to say or what I want to share. And if we're not careful, we will talk ourselves out of giving the gospel to them. When we need to be talking ourselves into giving the gospel to them because we don't know what God's doing or how he's working. Now, my question is this. We talked about being sensitive and opening our hearts, and now we're talking about reaching out. Are you reaching out tonight? Have you ever, and I'm not going to embarrass anyone, has there ever been a time in your life when you have opened a Bible and you have shown someone directly from the Bible how he or she could know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior? You'd be amazed how many Christians have never done that. In fact, by the way, that's not a bad way to witness. As you get to know them and they begin to ask questions, you can just simply use the phrase, hey, I'm a person of faith. There was a time in my life 
when I, I was searching and I didn't really know where I, what to do, and someone uh, came to me and opened the Bible and, and showed me from the Bible how I could have a personal relationship with Christ. I could have my sin forgiven and know for sure that when I die that I'm going to heaven. And I am so thankful today that I can say, hey, you know what? If something happens, I'm ready. And then all you have to do is say, has there ever been a time in your life when someone's opened the Bible and shown you from the Bible how you could know Christ as your person? You know, if you ask that question to most people, nine times out of ten, they'll say what? No. Nobody's ever done that for me. Nobody's ever shown me before. And then you just need to ask one more question. Would you be open to that? You'd be open to me just opening my Bible? Then you might say, well, wait a minute, preacher. You, I mean, you've got me way out on the limb now. I mean, I'm not even close to being close. Well, listen, you may need to bring someone along with you. I get that. You may need to get one of the gospel tracks out there. I picked up some today where you just pull this gospel track out and you kind of just walk them through it. I, I understand you may not feel always comfortable in sharing, but hey, you, you can read a gospel track and you can point to the right out loud. I mean, it's not that hard, folks. And you just begin to share the gospel with them. Now, they may have some questions you can't answer, but you know what? You don't have, all you got to say is, you know what? I'm not exactly sure to answer that one, but I'll tell you what I'll do is I have a friend. You don't have to tell him as your pastor. I have a friend that I bring that can answer your questions. How about if we meet again? And I know he can answer the questions you might have, but what are you doing? You're sharing the gospel. You're reaching out. Folks, one day we're going to find ourselves in heaven before the Lord. And I assure you that one of the things that every one of us would have wished that we would have done more is tell other people about Jesus Christ. To reach out to them with the gospel. And there may very well be someone in your family, some brother, some sister, some parent, someone that, that even right now as the Spirit of God is working in your heart, that he's laying the burden of that soul upon your soul. And the truth is, he's done it before, and you've talked yourself out of it in the past. But tonight, God wants you to talk yourself into it and say to the Lord, Lord, I don't know exactly how well I may fumble, I may stumble, I may trip, I may do all kinds of things, but I know that person does not know you, and I know that person, if, if, if anybody might have an opportunity to reach that individual, it's, it is I, and I am going to do whatever I need to do to be able to reach out to that person so that person can at least hear the gospel. I can't save him, but he needs to hear the gospel. Because I believe tonight what God is wanting us to do is not simply be sensitive, but to actually reach out. And then there's one last point, which is he wants you to reach out and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, interestingly enough, and I won't go all into it, Paul proclaims the gospel wisely here. He begins by where they are. He says, look, you're, you're superstitious. That's not a derogatory term. What he's saying is you're very religious. These were people that were searching and trying to find some connection in some way. He's not trying to alienate them here. He's not demeaning them in any way. He's actually embracing them where they are because he needs to take them along the path. Then he talks about this altar. I read it earlier, this, this altar to the unknown God. He says, look, I'm going to tell you who that God is. He's actually using their culture and even the architecture of their city and the idols that they've done. He's using that as a means to be able to motivate or to sort of negotiate his way to be able to give the gospel. And interestingly enough, he begins with creation. He goes all the way back to the beginning. You know, if people don't have a foundation, that's where you have to begin. That God's the creator, that he's the one that's created all of us, and that he created Adam and Eve, and that they disobeyed God in the, in the garden, and they sinned, and they brought sin upon the whole race. And he began to talk with them, and he began to, to, to communicate with them. But he, notice he doesn't also faithfully and accurately preaches the word of God. 
He talks about repentance. I was so happy this morning when your pastor was very clear about the fact it's not just the knowledge of knowing about Jesus Christ, but you have to have a personal relationship with him, and you have to be willing to turn from your sin unto Christ. So he preaches, he talks about repentance, he talks about re, uh, judgment, and he talks about the resurrection. In no way does he compromise the gospel at all. In fact, he doesn't need to. He just needs to shoot straight with people. You know what people need today is they need someone who loves them and cares for them, who is honest with them and tell them of their need for Christ and how that they can have their sin forgiven, how that they can know that they're going to heaven. You know, friend, that someone actually may be you. You may say, well, wait a minute, preacher. You know, uh, the pastor, I mean, you, you know, that's kind of his job. He's kind of the hired gun. I mean, that's why we pay him around here. I mean, he's the one that needs to be able to get, no, no. Listen, the pastor needs to be willing to witness and tell others about Christ, not because he's a pastor, but because he's a believer. Evangelism is not just for those that are, that are in, in full-time Christian ministry. It's for every child of God that knows the, the forgiveness of his sin and, and, is, and knows the gospel and, and can share that gospel. In fact, if we don't all share, there will be many, many that will never hear. And so here you have Paul uh, sharing. And then I want you to notice the last point here is this. Not only does he share it, but he shares it expectantly. You know, sometimes we share and we kind of, have you really done this? Well, I'm going to share, but I'm really not expecting much to happen. And I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I'm probably going to get my head bent off and they're going to ask me some question. I'm going gonna, gonna to embarrass myself. And, and we just kind of talk ourselves out of it. You know what God is wanting from us tonight? He's wanting us to be bold. He's wanting us to be convinced enough in our own hearts and our own souls that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to all that will believe. He's not wanting us to be ashamed or embarrassed. He's wanting us to be bold. And as we share, he, he's wanting us to share with the idea that, you know what, we actually expect something to happen. Notice as you skip toward the end, verse 32, it says this, and when they heard the resurrection of the dead, that was sort of the, the tipping point, some mocked, you know, we, we assume that everybody's going to mock, but everybody will not mock. There will always be some that mock. I don't, religion stuff. I don't. I don't need that crutch. You know. I'm not interested. No, no, not me. You know. You, if you want to be a person of faith, that's fine. But I'm not interested. And they may mock you a little bit. They may ridicule you a little bit. That's okay. But notice also there was a second group that said this. Others said we will hear thee again of this matter. It was kind of like their their heart just began to open a little bit. You know, rarely is it that you share the gospel the first time and someone opens his heart to Christ and he receives Christ immediately at that time. Most of the time, what's happening is you're sowing a little seed. Then you're coming back and watering that seed. And then maybe you're watering it again. And you're work in the heart of that individual. And maybe you're waiting for the right opportunity to share the gospel again. And it may take multiple touches of, on that life, your life upon that life, until that person begins to begin to be open and God begins to open his or her eyes. And then last of all, notice it says, um, how be it, verse 34, certain men clave unto, unto him, unto Paul, and believe. Folks, if we share the gospel consistently, regularly, faithfully, you know what? It might surprise us. In fact, I've had it happen sometime. You know, you'll, you'll say, hey, would, would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And you know what? They actually say yes. And it's kind of like, I mean, did you really hear me? Maybe I need to repeat all that again. You know, We're shocked. But we shouldn't be shocked. Because the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And the problem is not the gospel. The problem is we're not proclaiming the gospel. If we'll be faithful to proclaim it, some will mock. Some will say, hey, not today. Nah, let me think about this. But there'll be some that will actually believe. In this case, it notice, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite. He was one of those elite thinkers. 
one of those philosophers in that day. In fact, out of all the people that you would have expected to reject the gospel, this guy would have been the guy you thought would have rejected it. You would have never thought he would have accepted it. And then it says, and a, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Now, here's Paul, who is better on the run, exhausted, probably needs a break, a vacation, a holiday. And yet he looks around and he sees a city that is wholly given to idolatry. And God begins to stir his heart to the point where he is just moved, agitated, if you would. And, and rather than shutting the work of the Spirit of God down like we can so easily do, he begins to open his heart up. And he finds himself taking the gospel to the synagogue and to the marketplace and even to those ungodly philosophers, the Epicureans and, and the Stoics. I mean, they're not very unlikely to ever receive what he has to say. And to our amazement, God begins to work in the hearts of people and there are those that come to know Christ as their Savior. Folks, tonight, with all my heart, I don't think this is just for Paul's day. I don't think this message is just for Paul. I think this passage is for us, for you. Can I just ask you tonight, when's the last time your heart's been stirred for someone about the gospel? When's the last time that you tried to reach out in some way and connect with people and somehow uh, get that gospel opportunity where you can actually share the gospel message? When's the last time, if ever, you've ever opened your Bible and just told your story and taking them to the scriptures and personally led someone to Jesus Christ? As I mentioned, and I'll close with this, there's coming a day, if you know Christ, that we're going to stand before him. I don't think any one of us in our wildest imagination tonight can even begin to understand what that's going to be like. But I do know this. I, I would not want to stand before the Lord in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, and all of his love and redemption that he's provided for us, and, and be before him knowing that I have never, ever led someone to Jesus Christ. Maybe never even tried. Or for some of us, we used to do that. We used to be burdened. We used to care. We used to have compassion in our hearts for people that, that don't know Christ. But somehow we've grown a little cold, a little apathetic, a little comfortable. Tonight, will you allow the Spirit of God to stir your heart, to move you, to burden you for that neighbor, that co-worker, that loved one? And will you leave here tonight saying, hey, I don't know how it's going to happen, terrifies me for even to think it's going to happen. But some way, somehow, you know what? I'm going to reach out to that person. And I'm going to attempt to develop a redemptive relationship with that person so that I might have the opportunity to lead that individual to Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray.